Uh, today, I want to summarize our Cochrane review on uh, prophylactic HPV vaccination published in 2018. And I will discuss the criticisms against this review. Uh, this is the title page. So the title was Prophylactic Vaccination Against Human Papilloma Viruses to Prevent Cervical Precancer and Cancer. It was published mid-2018. Oh, we covered in this uh, Cochrane review uh, efficacy protection against um, persistent infection with 1618, uh, precancer cervical lesions, CN23 and adenocarcinoma in situ, and we distinguish the lesions associated with these vaccine types and all lesions, uh, irrespective of types. We distinguished uh, several exposure groups, the women who were initially at enrollment high risk HPV negative, just negative for the vaccine types, and all women, also those that were HPV positive. Uh, another thing we looked at was the number of received dose, and we separated our analysis uh, by age group. And then another important outcome we looked for was the safety of the vaccines. Well, in our Cochrane review, uh, due to uh, the software, the statistical program, um, we look for the relative risk. Uh, relative risk in women vaccinated against HPV versus the control group. Relative risk, it means that if the values are low, we are happy, the vaccine works well. In the literature, very often another measure uh, is reported, the vaccine efficacy. There's a very simple mathematical relation. Vaccine efficacy equals one minus relative risk. So when the vaccine efficacy is high, when you have a high values, uh, you're happy, it means the vaccine works. When you have 100%, vaccine efficacy, you have a perfect vaccine, you do not have an infection or a lesion anymore. Well, in our Cochrane, we included 26 published randomized trials, globalizing more than 73,000 women. Um, the findings were, in fact, not surprising. Uh, other reviews, and among them, uh, the WHO review, had already confirmed that the vaccine was working well if women are not yet infected with the vaccine types. Nevertheless, we could add to this bulk of evidence uh, two small um, new items which were not established before. We found statistically significant protection against adenocarcinoma in situ due to the vaccine types and uh, also irrespective of HPV types, so all adenocarcinoma in situ, in several exposure groups. Also, we found evidence, clinical evidence, that there was protection against CN2 and adenocarcinoma in women who were initially high risk and 1618 negative when less than three doses were given. This was not yet established before, and the decision was already taken at that time that uh, two uh, doses would be uh, sufficient in uh, girls less than uh, 14, 15, but this was based on uh, bridging evidence and immunogenicity, not yet on clinical evidence. So we have um, added evidence uh, which was clinical. Now, our Cochrane review uh, is a thick document of, uh, I do not know, 280 pages, I think. Uh, and here you have the summary in just one slide. Um, I want to explain a bit, and then I will magnify some pieces of this general diagram. There's the pointer. We have here the age groups, age group 15, 26, age group 24, 45. Uh, we have in rows the type of lesions, outcomes. 
We have a first group, the high-risk intraepithelial neoplasia lesions due to or associated with 1618. And we have in the next group all lesions, irrespective of those types. And we distinguish in each group CN2 plus, CN3 plus adenocarcinoma. And we have one uh, infection outcome, um, HPV persisting in, uh, infection uh, for six months or longer. Then we have in columns, we have the exposure groups. We have here in this column, uh, women who were completely high-risk HPV negative. We have in the next three columns, we have women who are negative for 16 or 18. They could have had other infections. Uh, we have in the last column, um, women, all women, also those who had initially a high-risk HPV infection, a 16 or 18 infection. Now for the middle group, we have also uh, data on the number of doses. Women who have received three doses as a typical per protocol group, women who have received one dose or more, and the difference, this was a computed outcome, is uh, women who received one or two lesions. Now, this is just a part of this overall uh, diagram. So I have deleted in the middle group those who have received uh, less than three doses. So to make it a bit uh, more simple. I also have used colors. I think I have a slide yeah, uh, for the legion. So in dark green we had high level protection. Um, means uh, relative risk lower than 0.10, it means vaccine efficacy higher than 90%. Uh, and um, unity was excluded from the confidence interval. Then in um, intermediate green, um, we had uh, protection in, of the level between 0 0.10 and 20, or protection between 80 and 90%. Uh, light green, um, relative risk higher than 0 0.20 means protection uh, lower than uh, 80%, but still significant, um, and so on. Um, in white, you should have uh, one included in the confidence interval, um, or in fact, it had to be gray in my um, I do not know why uh, it is in white. And then uh, in orange or red, but this did not happen, there was negative protection. Also, we added level of evidence uh, from high to very low, and we uh, reported that as a number of pluses. Now, I will uh, give more detailed information on a few cells. Two, and I think that I even have added a third one this morning. It means the group uh, of women 15 to 26 year old who were completely HPV negative and um, we consider the lesions due to 1618. We have here um, all CN2, which I will um, detail more. Uh, women who were, um, all women in fact, regardless of the initial HPV status, what you see, not all outcomes, not all cells have a color or data. In particular, in the older age groups, very few outcomes have documented data in the literature, also in the gray literature. Now, um, here uh, you can probably see um, uh, from everywhere in this room um, the protection against high-risk intraepithelial neoplasia associated with the vaccine types. Uh, you see always uh, dark green, the relative risks are very low, um, even for adenocarcinoma, we see significant protection. 
um, of 90% and for CN2, CN3, 99%. So in a completely naive population, you have a very high level of protection. Yeah, uh, good question. Um, we have uh, included, when we started our Cochrane, we just had the bivalent and the quadrivalent. When there was no heterogeneity between the two vaccines, we have pulled the data. When there was heterogeneity, we have split the data. And I will give an example where there was a uh, difference in efficacy according to the vaccine. Here is such an example. Um, here we have, uh, again, the young women, 15 to 26. We look at all the uh, CIN lesions, uh, irrespective of the HPV type they are associated with. Um, we uh, are still in the left column of the, the general uh, diagram. Um, and we see that for CN2 and CN3, we had different protection and therefore have given um, different uh, data. Protection against CN2 for the bivalent, so you see it by the index, uh, bivalent I had four studies, for the quadrivalent I had one study, the relative risk was 0 0.33 and 0 0.57 respectively. Um, for CN3, um, we have 0 0.8 and 0 0.54, so we had a very good protection. And we had two studies for the bivalent vaccine, the, the Patricia trial and a Japanese trial. Um, we had significant protection, but the protection was substantially lower in uh, the future trial. Um, so this is quite remarkable. When we look at all lesions, then we see differences uh, between the vaccines. When we look at lesions due to 16, 18, no difference. So this was uh, two uh, examples of uh, outcomes from the left column. Now I go to the right column where we include all women regardless of their HPV status at enrollment, um, then we see that colors become less, uh, less dark, more uh, light green, or even yellow. Um, protection against CN2 was 30% uh, or relative risk of 0 0.70. For CN3, we see again a difference. We see a better protection for the bivalent vaccine compared to uh, 0 0.55. It's lower than 0 0.81. So protection here is 45%, here 19%. This is again statistically significant. So we have a diagram. If you click on a cell, then immediately the forest plot opens. Unfortunately, I cannot demonstrate here. I just have a few uh, slides. Uh, protection against CN2 plus in the HPV 16, 18 negative group. So it is from the middle in the diagram. And uh, we look at women who are uh, 16, 18 uh, negative at baseline. Uh, we had protection in the younger group here, pooled. Uh, all vaccines pooled, because there's no difference. Uh, 0, 0.7, so it means 93%, very high level of protection in this per protocol group. Also good protection in the older group, nevertheless, it is a higher value. Here we have a protection of 84%. Here, uh, protection against any CN2+, if negative for high-risk HPV at baseline, um, the, it is CN2. It is not that spectacular uh, difference, but nevertheless, we see uh, a difference also for CN2+. Plus. Uh, it is 0 0.33 with the bivalent vaccine, 0 0.57 with the quadrivalent vaccine. 
So here, relative risks, again, I repeat, the lower, the better. Now, we also looked at uh, adverse uh, effects. And here, the most important outcome, the serious adverse events. Um, so it, it's a bit busy. You certainly cannot see. Let's, let's look at the uh, summary at the bottom. The relative risk of serious adverse effects in vaccinated versus the control was for cervix unity, was for Gardasil even lower than unity, but nevertheless unity included in the confidence interval. There was no statistical heterogeneity, so we can say that there is no increased risk for serious adverse events. This is what we concluded. Now, um, we did not include the nonavalent vaccine because these uh, data came afterwards and we had to exclude it because since we had written that the uh, control group should not have received an HPV vaccine. And the nonavalent vaccine, the control group received quadrivalent vaccine. The main paper is the paper from URA, um, and we um, estimated what the nonavalent vaccine could have generated uh, as protection if we simulate a uh, control group not vaccinated against HPV. Um, so it's a bit, bit difficult to explain in one minute, so I just uh, give comments on the uh, final result. We have two, two assumptions. We did that together with Mark Brisson from Canada. Um, so the protection of non-avalent vaccine against any CN2 in high-risk HPV negative women should probably be around 70-65%. Uh, but this is not observed. This is a computed uh, simulation. Now, I jump immediately to the conclusions. Uh, for both vaccines, we see that they are highly protective against persistent HPV-16-18 infection and CN2, CN3, and adenocarcinoma in situ associated with these types. If women are just negative for the HPV vaccine types and a fortiori also if they are uh, high-risk HPV negative at baseline. And also in older women, but we must observe a uh, lesser level of protection in older women. Both vaccines are less effective if administrated in groups that were already exposed to HPV 16-18 infection. It means that they are DNA positive or they are uh, sero positive, but we have seen that the serology status did not uh, influence significantly the outcome. So it is essentially the HPV DNA status, presence of DNA in a cervical specimen that matters. Um, but in this group, we still see significant protection. And uh, if you look at the risk difference, um, it's still uh, substantial. Um, so lower protection in older women, I say that already. The Tuvalent vaccine shows higher protection against lesions irrespective of HPV types. Uh, and we see that for CN2 plus and CN3 plus if women are baseline high risk HPV negative. And for CN3, uh, this uh, result was very substantial. Um, I can refer to the uh, recently published uh, data from uh, the, the program where they have used the bivalent vaccine, and we also see that the observations from the trial are reproduced in real life in the Scottish program. Protection uh, with less than three doses is also protective against the lesions associated with the types, um, but this is only in uh, young women, not in older women. Uh, the vaccine uh, generates local uh, adverse effects. They are well tolerated, but there is no increased risk in serious or systemic effects observed in the trials. So these were the conclusions of our Cochrane 
there were uh, broadcasted at, uh, there was a press conference in May 2018. We were at BBC, CNN, uh, uh, the newspapers. Uh, but a few months later, our friends uh, Lars Jorgensen, uh, Peter Gotcher, Tom Jefferson uh, published a paper in uh, a journal which I did not know before, evidence, BMG Evidence-Based Medicine, and they had four types of criticism, if I can uh, summarize them. The first one is that we were incomplete. Uh, we had missed 20 trials with about 50,000 women included, and so we should have been severely biased. Second comment, the safety data from the trials are completely worthless since women in the control arms received the adjuvants, aluminium, or other vaccines, active vaccines. Um, the trials just uh, document protection against infection and lesions, but not against cancer. Uh, infections and lesions can uh, cure spontaneously, uh, so we do not have any evidence that this uh, vaccine is uh, protecting against something serious, and conflicts of interest of the authors was also something they highlighted. So, uh, the first criticism, we had missed 20 trials. So, very remarkably, the list of the 20 trials was not included in the paper. Um, nevertheless, um, they, they published uh, earlier an index of 206 trials, randomized, non-randomized, commercial, non-commercial, uh, but when we looked in this index, there were just 100 trials. So there were man many doubles. We considered in our protocol, uh, in the material and methods, only phase two and phase three studies. They included phase four studies. And there was one Finnish big uh, phase four study that contained the bulk of these uh, 48,000 women we did not include. Now, in our Cochrane, we focused on peer-reviewed literature. Nevertheless, for the serious adverse effects, we made an exception. Cochrane had asked us to do, and even it was a Cochrane collaborator who looked for the grey literature. We did not do it ourselves, we just accepted it. Uh, we did some quality control, uh, we were happy with that. But if there were incompleteness, we are not alone. Also, uh, Cochrane collaborators uh, can be blamed for that. Um, when we finally have obtained this list of 20 trials, uh, we could add two trials. They had forgotten two of our forgotten trials, uh, which they did not find. Um, but if we look at this list of 20, plus two is 22, were there really trials which we have missed, uh, which we could have included in our Cochrane according to our own inclusion criteria, and there was, in fact, just one. One trial from South Africa, but where there are no uh, clinical outcomes, um, just infection. And uh, it was only discussed, it was only, the results were only in the discussion, they were not in the results. Because the clinical uh, outcomes were not the focus of that paper. Also, there were trials with males or, uh, or with, with mixed males and females, and we could not extract the data uh, for the females. Let's go back. So they, uh, what is also remarkable, I, I uh, go down to the second bullet. Um, and I go to the second criticism. Yeah, we have compared in the safety uh, outcomes, the serious adverse effects in 
women that were vaccinated against HPV against those who were vaccinated with something else, aluminium or another vaccine. Um, so Jefferson, the third author of the criticism, had published in 2004 in Lancet Infectious Diseases a meta-analysis on the adverse effects associated with aluminium as an adjuvant in vaccines. And he concluded, we found no evidence that aluminium salts in vaccines cause any serious or long-lasting adverse effects. Despite a lack of good quality evidence, we do not recommend that any further research on this topic would be undertaken. Now, if you would have to address uh, an additional safety uh, analysis where you uh, administrate a complete inert product, you need for every trial a third arm. And this would make trials and research uh, for HPV vaccination extremely expensive. Um, we know that uh, aluminum is used in vaccines since 15 years. Uh, including more than a billion of administrated doses. There were no concerns among regulatory agencies about that. Now, biased reporting. Um, they just give an example, one example as evidence that we were biased. Uh, Chairman, how, may, how much time I still have? Ten minutes? Okay. I will come to it. Um, they looked at the Patricia trial and they looked at serious adverse effects and they found in the vaccine group they found 1,000 serious events. In the placebo group, 982 events, a relative risk of 0 0.07, but they did not report that. Uh, we computed that. Now, they looked at the list of all the events which were in the appendices of some uh, databases. We looked at women with serious adverse events. Some women had more events. So, we had another outcome indicator, but no, they present that we were biased and we make errors. So, we had uh, published these data with a relative risk of 1.01. Um, now, when we looked at this list of individual events, not women with events, but the events itself, we did that also, and we have seen that they have made an error. So, they had made a bias. We, this, this uh, outcome is completely correct. But they do not report to the reader that they look for something else. So this is really, f they look for something, they find something, they isolate it, and they consider it as an argument, a piece of evidence against our evidence. Now, in the meanwhile, we have looked for these uh, gray studies, uh, which were not picked up by our colleagues from Cochrane. Um, we verified they were not eligible for our Cochrane, because we had uh, our criteria. Um, and we looked for the relative risk in uh, studies for serious adverse. Nevertheless, some of these studies contained serious adverse events data. When we look for the relative risk in these uh, forgotten trials, we come to 0 0.85, whereas in our, it was around unity. Uh, so, we, if we would have not included grey literature where there are more serious harms, then they would have a point. But in fact, the opposite is true. Um, there are also some trials, and among them also a non-avalent trial, not compared against, um, yeah, not reporting clinical data, but safety data, where the control group had received um, saline water. And there, are, uh, there is another trial, a Japanese trial. Now, we have then separated all studies 
included in Cochrane or not, according to the product given in the control group, uh, saline water, aluminium adjuvants, another vaccine without aluminium, and a uh, vaccine with aluminium, and we did not see any difference in relative risk for serious adverse effects. Conflict of interest and independence of review. Um, there was an investigation a priori, but also a posteriori, about our conflicts and the uh, Cochrane arbiter, an addition, but also a jurist. Uh, they uh, concluded that the authors of the HPV review adhere to the strict Cochrane policy of conflict of interest. Um, the Jorgensen paper was reviewed by one author belonging to the same field of opinion. Our Cochrane meta-analysis was reviewed by 12, I think between 12 and 14. It depends on the beginning of the end. Uh, and one of them was Tom Jefferson, the one of the criticism, and he just had minor remarks. Now, in the meanwhile, we have published on our website uh, our conflict of interest policy and our statements on private-public collaboration. And this is now uh, seen as a template which we would like to share with other national institutes of public health. Um, and I'm still working in my institute. In the meanwhile, the second author has been fired from the Cochrane collaboration, from the Nordic Cochrane collaboration, and also from the hospital where he had worked. And his criticism on our Cochrane was the immediate, uh, but not only reason for that. So to conclude, and this is my last slide, I think, uh, this criticism was sensational, there was no documentation, the poor quality of the review process of that paper was very poor, there was no substance, relative risk for the severe adverse effects, uh, which were in the great literature, was not higher than unity. Uh, they selected uh, cases from uh, an obscure database on safety, VGBase, also a person who is associated with anti-vaccine lobby. Uh, nevertheless, this uh, Cochrane review and, the, and, and the, the, the criticism has resulted in a serious crisis at the level of Cochrane collaboration and yeah, good communication of evidence, transparency is very important. We suffer all in the world uh, from the vaccination hesitancy and the work of anti-vaccine lobbies. It undermines the confidence of stakeholders, of the public, of women, of doctors. And uh, yeah, we have to think about how to tackle that. No, still our Cochrane correctly synthesizes the safety and efficacy of the two and the quadrivalent vaccines. An update is ongoing where we will include the nonavalent and other new vaccines that is in progress. The anti-vaccine movement is a serious threat and undermines confidence of the public and we should find solutions for that. So this is now my real last slide. Uh, so dear chairman, Dear friends uh, in the public, I thank you a lot for your attention. Thank you, Mark. Uh, any questions from the audience? Yes, Rolando, please. Yeah, I think it's, it's very useful to get this explanation of what you say about this being used by the anti-vaccine groups to, to justify their claims, no? But uh, I wanted to I mean, try to ask you to expand a little bit on your findings about the non-availant. I know they're pr maybe preliminary and based on modeling, but they seem, I mean, the non-availant, that seems to be even less good than the bivalent in your data. So, and that's, that's quite, a, quite a finding in a way, you know, because people are thinking that because it's non-availent, it's pro gonna protect 
95% or 97% and you're coming up with a much lower risk. So I propose to you that we develop a vaccine against warts and this together with the bivalent vaccine, we can recommend that. No, yeah, that's a good <laughs> sense. Or, or, or vaccine with one first yeah. and, the, se and, the, um, and the second dose the other. There are different uh, explanations, but they are all speculatory. We have seen that. I, I, I also looked for for an artifact in the calculation and the isolation of the groups in the numerators and denominators for explaining that. And there are indeed uh, uh, some arguments for that. But even if we, there is a paper uh, published in the National Cancer Institute that um, if the Gardasil groupings and definitions are applied to the cervix and vice versa, then we see that the contrasts become a bit smaller, but they do not disappear. Um, so it could be that the adjuvant, there is an immune stimulator, uh, a tall cell-like receptor molecule, um, that could maybe an explanation. There's also immunologists say that the shape of the uh, VLP uh, complex is a bit different, but up to now there is no consensus among immunologists to explain these observed differences, but the differences are there. So I would like to ask um, if you think of this efficacy data, so what is your opinion and expectation about uh, then screening policies in HPV vaccinated? You know, I mean that in the real life uh, vaccination program, the coverage is variable and then screening program starts often at age 20 to 24 or 25 where these uh, yeah, uh, um, would... lesions, regressive lesions and infections are still very common and people will observe them. Whereas in modeling the suggestion is to go for start a screening at rather old age, so that, how do you see we, we, all these developments and what should we do about we, it? We cannot answer your question from the trials, but we can look at data coming out already from the uh, vaccinations since more than 10 years. Um, there is a, a good uh, review on, on that done by an Italian group, there's the paper of, of uh, Paolo Rossi, um, and he comes up that, um, yeah, we could start later in the HPV-based screening programs. Often there is cytology from 25 up to 30, and then uh, you continue with, with uh, HPV after 30. So he proposes that if you have highly vaccinated uh, cohorts, uh, then you could stop this uh, screening with cytology before the age of 30. Maybe we can consider starting later, longer intervals, stopping earlier, having just one screen in a lifetime or two screens in a lifetime. These are all possible proposals, but up to now there is no international consensus. And yeah, it is good that we look at the data how the landscape is changing in this vaccinated cohort with current screening programs, also HPV-based screening programs. This will give more data, uh, but we will have to adopt the screening policies. That's as clear. Okay, so I think uh, in the interest of time, we will need to move on, but I encourage further discussion later.